This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you and uh, talk about agriculture. Today, I'd like and we'd like to share our vision for our future of agriculture. Uh, but we can't, ta we can't talk about the future without acknowledging the significance uh, of this moment. Uh, this summer, actually, the planet's ocean and land temperatures reached new heights. The month of July was the hottest ever recorded. Once again, record heat waves and a series of extreme weather events uh, made it very clear that climate change is escalating and that we are reaching a dangerous point and a tipping point. To reverse this worrying trend, we have to do nothing less than rewiring our entire economy and make it sustainable. Many aspects of our lives have to change how we generate energy, how we produce, how we consume and deliver goods, how we build our houses and cities, how we move around and indeed how we manage our land and grow our food. A transformation of such magnitude is a monumental challenge, but it's a mission possible. The European Green Deal recognizes both the enormity of the task and the potential we have to advance a cleaner, climate-neutral uh, economy and restore Earth's natural ecosystems. But what's also true is that even if we stopped all greenhouse gas immediately, the climate would continue to change because past emissions are baked into the atmosphere for the next two or three decades. So we also have to adapt uh, to what is already unavoidable. This double challenge to of mitigating and adapting to climate change is perhaps no more apparent than in agriculture. Agriculture is a major contributor uh, to climate change, but it's also at the same time heavily affected by it. By 2050, climate change is projected to reduce harvest yields by 17%. On top of this, there will be 20% less land available for farming. At the same time, we need to feed an additional 2.2 billion people. That's 2.2 billion more mouths to feed. Combined with climate change impacts, we need to increase food and feed output by 50% to meet higher demands and shifting diets. The urgent task before us now is to transform today's farming practices and methods to switch to sustainable, regenerative agricultural practices that increase productivity and build climate resilience. This is going to be hugely challenging, but it's achievable if we work with nature, not against it, and if we are open to new approaches that help us to produce enough food for more people and at the same time restore our uh, natural world at the same time. This means embracing a vision of agriculture that takes the cues from nature but is augmented as needed with innovation and technology. For example, the possibilities of nitrogen fixation. Today, synthetic fertilizer is widely used and is helping to feed 3.5 billion people, but 
it has an impact on the environment and produces greenhouse gas emissions which account to 3% of the global ones. But there are certain crops like soybeans that don't need actually fertilizers. So why is that? Because on their roots are tiny microbes that pull nitrogen out of the air. And so they produce fertilizers for the crop for free. By using new technologies, gene editing in this case, we can now recreate the genetic code of this microbe on soy and add the same trait to other staple crops like corn, wheat and rice. This way we can give them the ability to naturally produce fertilizers too. By borrowing insights from nature, a solution like this has the potential to rev revolutionize agriculture because it would largely displace the need for synthetic fertilizers altogether and so to help uh, reduce pollution and bring, how, uh, bring down greenhouse gas emissions significantly. What's been missing also today so far from this story, um, however, is the voice of the farmer. Farmers are on the front line of climate change and at the same time are heavily impacted by it. As it turns out, farmers are also key allies in tackling the climate crisis. They are willing to embrace change and are eager participants in driving the transformation to a more sustainable future. So how do we know all this? Because we asked them. In a global survey conducted in eight markets, farmers from around the globe shared their views with us. So what did these farmers tell us? First, farmers are already living with climate change. It's impacting them right now and today and will continue to impact them. 71% say climate change has a, a large impact on their farm already today. Second, Farmers are adapting to climate impacts already today. 65% seeking new technologies to adapt their farm and their practices to climate change. And even more, they are aiming to be part of the climate change solution. 84% intend to apply practices to directly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Fourth. Farmers, no matter where they are, told us that innovation was critical to build resilience and grow their business. Just over half say they need innovation in seeds and trades and new modern crop protection products to better cope with extreme weather conditions. So what this tells us is farmers are resilient and optimistic about the future, but they are looking for access to new solutions, new, te to, uh, new technologies and more innovation. And above all, their voice to be heard. And they need combined action mm, from industry, government and consumers worldwide if they are going to continue to grow and leave the world in a better state than before. So what can companies like Bayer of our farmers and how can we help drive transformation in agriculture? The short answer is science and scale. With our innovation pipeline and our global reach, we can respond to farmers' needs and deliver the kind of solutions they are looking for, which meets the expectation of society at the same time. Our view is that the future of farming is regenerative because regenerative practices offer a way to improve productivity on the farm and benefit nature at the same time. This approach treats each farm as an ecosystem by itself. Put simply, for us, regenerative agriculture is about producing more and restoring more, and it's focused on a key set of outcomes. The goal is to help farmers achieve higher yields and productivity, 
higher incomes for them and their families and better livelihood. And for nature, recover and thrive, which includes limiting the further expansion of farmland and mitigating climate change. Since farming conditions and challenges are unique everywhere, we support farmers with customized solutions. This means we are less focused on selling individual products. Instead, we want to provide farmers with whole farming systems that combine different innovations, new digital technologies, precision breeding, biotechnology, and modern crop protection. Here too, science is allowing us to understand more about nature and one's imaginable. For example, when it comes to modern crop protection, we now have a better scientific understanding than ever before about the makeup of living organisms and the environment. Using artificial intelligence, we can now quickly and accurately identify a single protein that is unique to a specific pest. And then design a molecule that will inhibit this particular protein and this protein only, according to safety and sustainability profiles. The molecule we design can be thought of as a key that matches up a unique lock, which is why we call this innovation crop key. This new approach of crop protection means that we can control a specific pest without affecting any other non-target species. It's a potential game changer in agriculture, going above and beyond current standards and can help to greatly minimize the impact of crop protection products on the environment. We are convinced that innovations like these will revolutionize agriculture for the better and could open future opportunities for farmers to tap into new sources of revenue by conserving carbon, sourcing renewable fuels, enhancing crop fertility, or regenerating natural habitats, in addition to producing more yields and income. As Bayer, we, huge potentially, uh, we see a uh, huge potential to scale up regenerative practices on farms across Europe and around the world, uh, in big farms and small farms. By the middle of next decade, Bayer envisions shaping regenerative agriculture on more than 160 million hectares globally, built on the foundation of its leading agricultural solutions. Innovation will be absolutely critical in this endeavor. That's why we are investing heavily in new solutions and technologies. Last year, we spent 2.6 billion euros in research and development in crop science alone to develop new sustainable products. We believe that Europe can play and has to play a leading role and become a global standard bearer when it comes to sustainable and regenerative agriculture. We are committed to Europe as a center of scientific research and development, especially in the area of modern crop protection. And that's why we just announced a 220 million investment in our research and development facilities in our headquarters in Monheim, Germany, to develop the next generation of crop protection made in Europe. These products have a better environmental profile than any of those currently available. It's clear, however, that no single company or organization can tackle global challenges like climate change or food security alone. We need strong partnerships between the public and private sectors and amongst all key stakeholders from across the entire food and value chains, with farmers being at the very center of it. Because only together 
we can thrive the fundamental um, um, transformation that is needed to make sustainable farming a reality. It is our hope that a future uh, in which sustainable and regenerative agriculture is the norm will allow farmers to improve their benefits and those of the communities they serve, while at the same time protecting and nurturing our natural world for future generation. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, if you're tuning in now or joining us in the room, my name is Bartosz Brzezinski. I am a Politico's uh, food and agriculture reporter. And uh, this session will be focusing on crop protection, ensuring a more sustainable use of pesticides, plant protection products. Um, before I introduce our panelists, don't forget to use uh, the Swap Card app to ask your questions. If you are in the room, scan the QR code on the screen. And if you're following online, please check the instructions on our event website. You can also tweet your reactions at Life Politico using Politico AgriFood hashtag. Mm, so without further ado, uh, joining us in the room, from the left, we have Marta Mesa, Secretary General of Slow Food, a network that promotes local f traditions, local, f culture, local, local food cultures, sustainable um, diets, and healthy eating. We have Johan, uh, no, MEP Irene Torleret from uh, Renew Europe. And she's a French MEP. We have further on, we have Johan Meyerhofer. He's the head of the crop protection section of Deutsche Bauernverband. <laughs> I will <laughs> switch to saying German Farmer Association, the largest farmer association in Germany. And to his left, we have Rachel Rachel-Rama. She's a global head of small molecules at Bayer. She's a scientist working on crop protection products. And joining us online, we have uh, the Parliament's Rapporteur on the Sustainable Use of Pesticide Regulation, the Pesticide Reduction Law, SUR, whatever you want to call it, Green MEP Sarah Wiener. Um, so she's the, she's the lead in the Parliament on the negotiations on this file. And we probably all know, uh, the, and we've seen, we've heard, uh, and we've been following for about uh, two years now, or almost two years, without getting too far ahead, the negotiations on the sustainable use of pesticides regulation. This has proven to be a contentious file, as we have heard from Lithuanian minister earlier today. Um, there, is a lot, there has been a lot of pushback from uh, national governments, also in the parliament. We have uh, negotiations that have been moving on at a very slow pace. We have a vote coming up in October in the Agri Committee, followed by the Environment Committee, and possibly a plenary vote still this year. Um, it's, it's been, there has been a lot of contention, there has been a lot of crit criticism against the Commission's proposal with stakeholders from every side of the political spectrum criticizing various elements of this proposal. We also now are entering into the final stages of the glyphosate debate. Glyphosate is up for renewal again, and it's the most widely used herbicide in farming, but it's also proven to be the most divisive one. We have um, EFSA, European Food Safety Authority, EU regulators um, saying it should be renewed, but then we also have um, civil society, green MEPs, green lawmakers, such as Germany, uh, Germany's agriculture minister arguing glyphosate has no place in European agriculture. So, yeah, entering into this debate, uh, I want to maybe start off with um, Sarah Wiener, since you're the lead on the, on the Parliament's 
debate. Where are we? Can you give us a quick update on um, how much has changed since earlier this year you proposed the Parliament's vision? A Parliament's vision for what this report, for what this law should look like, what these targets should be like. What has, what has changed since and how far do you think we can get within this Parliament mandate? Good day to everyone. I just wanted to uh, say, first of all, we need this sewer because um, we need to reduce pesticides. We have, uh, we face biodiversity crisis and climate crisis. We have a, a pollution problem. We have a, a loss of fertile soil. So there's no question that we need to uh, reduce pesticides. And uh, we are still in the negotiations and it's uh, going very um, slow to say, but we make progress and we will see what's coming up. I don't want to speak now on details because we are still in the process and we negotiate every week. So I'm very hopeful that we will close and have um, um, something substantial maybe then in November when it's, uh, the votes are going uh, in the plenary. Turning to Iran, uh, Renew Europe, the Liberals have taken kind of a, a, a nuanced approach to this, to this proposal. One of, your, one of your group's big pitches is we need to ensure that for every withdrawn pesticides from the market under this proposal, this proposed law, uh, we need to have alternatives. Farm, farmers need to be provided with alternatives. What's your take? Do you agree with Sarah Wiener's uh, remark that we need this sewer? Uh, we need sure, but we need sure for the level playing field and for the harmonization for farmers inside of our European Union also. Because before we had a directive, so we can also protect biodiversity, but the change is also that we have a regulation and not a, a directive. So I think that of course, uh, uh, we need to produce food and uh, we must make sure in all what we do that uh, we provide farmers with alternative. We have uh, the best farmers in the world in, uh, in, in Europe, so we have the most sustainable agriculture. They are not living in the past, so we must also uh, uh, listen to them and accompany them so that they are not left with uh, uh, no uh, solution. That means that what is very important for me is that sure, is not uh, 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 a political objective, but a reality in all the farms. And for that, we need feasibility on research. And once we put money on research, then we must allow. That means that we must have also maybe fast tracks for biocontrols or new techniques, and maybe conditionality for uh, uh, some uh, of uh, uh, the laws on uh, research and innovation, uh, like new breeding techniques. Of course, very strong for us, harmonization and a, a level uh, playing field. And last but not least, reciprocity. We must not import the food we do not want to produce in Europe. Thank you. Johan, uh, you represent farmers. Um, pesticides are expensive, pesticides are essential, pesticides are necessary evil. What's your take on this proposal? What's your take on the targets? Speaking from farmers' perspective. Yeah, first of all, I have to agree with uh, Mrs. Wiener that we have to reduce the use of pesticides, of course. Um, what our problem, so, so far we share the goals even of the SUR, and even if the 50% are very optimistic, um, we take it as a challenge. Um, but our problem is the way to reduce such a high percentage um, is not pro pragmatic and it, it, it is simply not feasible. Um, and what's more the problem, um, there are no real good ideas in the proposal how this can be done. Even if the technique is emerging, spot spraying is uh, a real game changer and um, it is a new technique, and we should, if we, if we really try to, to, to reach the 50%, we should talk about this. Uh, and it's simply without any sense to, to bring in so much bureaucracy, so much 
documentation um, which documents only things which have to be done. Um, and I think we should focus more on solutions which really helps us to try uh, to, to, to reach the 50%. So we would be happy to speak about these solutions and not only about documentation and over sensible areas and rules in these areas which are simply forcing farmers into organic farming, which is, I think, not, not very good because if you force a, a farmer to do something which he's not really longing for, it, it won't be successful. And I think it even is a, a problem for the organic farming sector itself because if you force a conventional farmer to change into organic farming, uh, this will not be a good PR for the organic sector because you, you, you create uh, some kind of a, a mental enemy and that's no good. Mm -hmm. Marta, your network also represents farmers uh, with ideas like uh, sustainable farming practices like agroecology and all that. Um, what's your take on this, uh, including what Johan was saying? So, first of all, of course, we need a reduction of pesticides, and in that sense, the sewer was a welcome piece of legislation that we're very much looking forward to in terms of its next steps. But we see this as a piece of the puzzle. Um, we see this as a piece of the puzzle of the Green Deal and Farm to Fork strategy, where as crucial as the sewer is the sustainable food systems law legislation that we were expecting a, a communication yesterday but we have had no word. And for instance, to mention another measure, animal welfare. And this is because overall, if we want to tackle the multiple crises that we agree are there, if we want to empower farmers to continue producing food, to continue producing food for humans and so ensure food security, we need to have a broader approach that doesn't just look at substituting what substance for another, but what steps do we need to take to do this transition, taking absolutely farmers along. We know that farmers are struggling, um, but coming from our own experiences of food as a global grassroots movement in 160 countries worldwide involving farmers, food artisans, cooks, um, activists, our experience is that the farmers that are in working, uh, involved in our network are already working basically without pesticides, without synthetic pesticides. They do not need them, they are not interested in them, and that's not because they're substituting that for another substance, but because there is this approach to farming that is comprehensive and it's the agro agroecological approach. So where you're having a connection to the field you work with in, you have a connection with the animals you farm, um, you work with food biodiversity, that's also something very important that we've been working with, and we can go back to that. But essentially, there is, it's an overall process, and in that sense, um, it, we, in taking the farmers along in this process, and I agree, we do not need to force farmers, but if you look at what the CAP, the most resourceful policy, has been encouraging in the last uh, 30 years more, uh, has been a certain kind of production. This is not to say that farmers were not free to choose, but subsidies go a long way. So do university courses. What are we teaching in university courses when it comes to agriculture? So do advisory services play a big role in showing farmers what are the range of possibilities in terms of practicing sustainable farming? And Rachel, um, when we talk about pesticides, we talk about chemicals that are designed to either kill the weeds, kill, in, kill pestis, pests, insects. Um, and there are, of course, concerns raised uh, by green lawmakers, civil society, as well as scientists. Uh, not all scientists, but at least a, a certain um, sector of, of the scientific community around the health and environmental concerns that we're still kind of playing around with fire here. As a scientist working for a company that manufactures these chemicals, how do you how do you respond to these kind of questions and, and concerns? Yeah. And just to come back on the policy, we are a lot discussing about reducing the use of the of the plant protection product. But maybe we can discuss a little more uh, outcome driven meaning uh, to reduce the impact on the environment of the the, the product, eh? because. Removing the pro removing crop protection product, you remove a key tool in the toolbox of the of the farmers. And today, crop protection is uh, safeguarding 30% of the yield overall eh, in the in the world. It's the food for two billion people. 
So crop protection somewhere, somewhere is, is a tool and it's, it's completely essential. But uh, we understand also that we have to evolve and, and uh, make evolve the, 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 the science we are having. And um, else, environment and everything is not incompatible with crop protection. I'm spending my whole days with my team to think about what can be the, the crop protection of the future. What are the next generation? How it can be more sustainable? And it's what we are doing and we already have had, uh, we are working with a new ways of doing science that we call crop key. And there is a lot of new tools everywhere. Uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and everything that we can use in our labs to open up new f research fields. And it's what we are doing. And we are now very precise on what we are doing in the labs for the new mode of action, because we need new mode of action for the, for the crop protection, but also to design the molecule we are doing. And, and this precision is not only on the molecule that we should have to avoid that there is effect on non-target organisms, but also the way we are using them. And you were talking about the spot treatment. We are developing a lot this precision application. Now we are able to scan a, a, a field and to spot where the weeds are, and after to send a robot or, or, or a tractor, which is able to spray only on the weed. So you have, you have far more or less impact of the crop protection. So I think that we should think a little more about how to reduce the impact of the crop protection and not to remove a tool that the farmer needs. And honestly, uh, uh, if we do that, it can be really revolutionary. And, it's, and I have to say that it's not easy eh? because we are working on it. We are more than 1,000 working on that question currently in Bayer, and it's not easy. It's super ambitious to, to find a new uh, crop protection product with less impact. But we are dedicated to, to do it, and uh, the first one are going to be on the market in 2030. So, turning to Sarah on, on the screen, uh, you've described this proposal as the Commission's proposal, as a as a as a kind of the, you've you've in outlining your report, your take on this. Um, you you described some certain flaws in this proposal, and you actually even stepped up the ambition further. Uh, increasing some of the targets for the most toxic pesticides, um, increasing increasing some of the some of the rules, um, the stringency. What about the arguments, including from Johan here, um, who, who's and Rachel just now, that this this law could could also risk having an immediate impact on farmers by taking away the tools that they need by um, putting these these kind of requirements on them that that increase the burden. That's where farmers are already taking the effort, making the effort to uh, to, in, to introduce practices, more sustainable farming practices. Um, do you th do you agree with that assessment? I do not agree what um, the audience were telling us. Uh, so first, when we speak about farmer and farmer protection, then let's face that from 2005 to 2020, uh, 37 percent uh, of farms vanished um, and from them were 87 percent of these small-scale farmers after, uh, under five hectares. So um, obviously this agricultural uh, intensive system with monoculture and uh, high I input who costs a lot is not working anymore, not for the farmers and not for the nature. So there are a lot of tools um, in the world and it shows that is, it is possible to go with the nature and uh, protect more biodiversity and also the farmer and the biodiversity of the farmers. Um, in the sewer, I wrote that we first have to use IPM, integrated pest management, as white crop rotations, under sowing, promoting natural uh, uh, insects who help uh, benefic uh, beneficial insects and so on. So uh, it's not about change uh, one techno fix to the other for an industry like, sorry to say that, Bayer, who is um, who is dominate the whole pesticide market, uh, the global pesticide market. There are just uh, four industries left. 
And they make a huge money, a big money about that. Now they see it doesn't work. And now they try to have another techno fix to say, now we have the solution. Now we understand that our uh, products uh, harms the environment and the water, the surface, uh, the health of people and animals. So, but now we have the solution. And um, maybe that it, few of them can help. But why not going with the nature without any cost to make um, a better balance in between uh, all the farmers and the farmer who want to have this uh, techno fix and have to pay a lot of money of that and give it in one patent uh, direction. So me personal as an organic farmer i can tell you it's not about to convince that everyone has to have a certificate uh, and to say i'm a organic farmer it is about to change the agriculture to make it more resistant and resilient for the future for our children and for ourselves and you can do that very easily with agroecological tools and so before i want to open maybe a new books of Pandora, uh, we should work with these natural uh, tools who are all spread in the world. And you can see, we just speak about uh, agroecological monocultures um, with all the five same crops against organic agro uh, um, industrial um, models. And we never speak about all in between alternative um, agriculture uh, systems and models like micro farming, agropastoral systems, um, agroforestry, permaculture, and so on and so on. So the future of the agriculture has to be regional and then we can tackle this a uh, lot of crisis. And it's not about to give just few um, companies in this world, the possibility and to, um, to make them um, the path for, for, for a new business. I don't think this is the, um, I want this is the solution. Just, just Johan, you represent, your, com your organization represents the most farmers in Germany. What's your, what's your response to this? Is it, is it, a feasible, is it feasible for farmers to, to take up uh, what Saravina was just referring to? with and what would be how would that look it, it would be completely feasible if there would be a market for uh, more organic products or if they are not certificated for some kind of a non certificated organic product um, but there is no market for this uh, there is a market for organic products of course and the market was growing in the last years or decades but we see now when money gets a little bit not so much anymore, uh, the market is uh, still a little bit growing, but not, not as, as uh, in, in the way it uh, grow, grow in the last years. So first of all, it's a market problem. It's, it's no problem from, from the farming system because everybody who knows what to do can change into organic or, or half organic system. Um, but in the end, you, you need to have customers for your products. So this is a big problem. So I, I clearly say, give us the market, give us the customers, many farmers will do it. Because farmers are economically thinking. And if something works economically, they will do it. And if, you, if they see something which is successful, they will copy it because they are intelligent people. Um, so I think we have to, to, to solve the market problem first. But let me just add one other thing. I'm coming from a family which did farming for over 400 years. A classic family-run farm. And the reason why we, we, we lose so much small farms, sorry, but it has nothing to do with how intense the farming system is. It has much to do about the chance of earning more money outside of agriculture. It has much to do with the personal ways of living, because I can tell my two cousins had the chance to, to, to take over the farm, and both said, no, it is not the life we imagine. We've seen the life of our father and of our granddad, and it's just, just not what we want. 
um, but it was nothing about the way of farming. And I know many other farmers who have no chi who, whose children do not want to be farmer anymore, but none of them said uh, we have a problem with the farming system. It, it's again, it was a little bit about money, but oftentimes it was just of this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. So there is no such a connection, please. I think this is it's simply not true. Mm -hmm. yeah, your, your group represents kind of the liberal approach uh, to the economy. Um, What's your, what's your take on what Johan was saying about market incentives and, and there being a demand for certain types of products as opposed to others? Um, um, I think, uh, <clears throat> first of all, that there are things we all agree on. Uh, we want uh, to have uh, uh, access to quality food for everybody and, uh, if possible, uh, produce uh, uh, the more locally as possible and uh, from farms that are the most resilient as possible. And to come back on uh, what uh, uh, Sarah was uh, saying on agroecology, I mean, Cap Money and Farmers Association have been funding studies and research to just look at how to use less pesticide for years. I come from the south of France. We have uh, been working to develop uh, resistant varietals. It took us 20 years and it started with uh, vintners, uh, looking at uh, uh, different varietals in their vineyard. So the wheel is common. But then after, we must not shy away from facts and figures. Uh, globally, we ha will have more people to feed, planet-wise. And it happens that Europe has a temperate climate and very good production capacities. So uh, we have a feeding uh, role in our agriculture. I'm quite proud that Europe, especially at this moment with all the uh, food crisis that have been revealed by uh, the Ukraine war, that we stand by our responsibility in terms of uh, uh, feeding people. So it's very important that we look at the fact that we have to produce more and we decide how do we produce more. Is it by intensivity or is it by deforestation? Because if we do not produce more on the different arable lands, it means that we will need to create new arable lands. So we must not shy from our responsibility. Second point is if we decrease our yields, then the price of the food will increase. And we, at the moment, have a huge problem of uh, people that work uh, to income salaries in Europe that have difficulties eating. So it's very important that we do not shy away as legislators for the from the consequences of our legislation on the price of food. And the uh, third point was that, sorry to say that, uh, but it's not because a pesticide is natural that it's good for the, the, the environment. At the moment, I hope that Sarah will help me on my uh, fight against the insecticide that are called Pierre Vert or Pyretroid. Because the way they are produced outside of uh, uh, Europe using arable land in, Atri in Africa that could produce food for the, uh, uh, for the Africans. And the way they are sprayed by plane on cities is for me a total shame. We have new pests that are developing, and it's not sure that we will have natural products that will help us meet this uh, production, competitivity, sustainability, economic sustainability for our farmers. So we need to have all the tools and work together, but for me, it's very important that we deliver on the accessibility for good food. It's a uh, uh, fundamental right of every citizen, be it in Europe or outside of Europe, that we do not split the society between the good guys that have the means to buy organic food from the ideal uh, little uh, farm from the prairie and the bad guys that are on food aid that uh, eat imported food that is produced with precisely all the things that we forbid in Europe. Martha, you've been taking notes this whole Time we have. Let's keep the applause for after the session finishes. But uh, Marta, you've been taking notes this whole time. Uh, how do you respond to this? Including you, you come from a global network. Uh, to this idea that Europe has the responsibility to, 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 to feed the rest of the world because of its capacity and. 
I would like to challenge that yeah. assumption and the assumption that uh, there is issue of lack of food. UN data demonstrate that we're producing enough food nowadays to feed the world. It's not an issue of lack of food. The issue is access to land, access to seed, access to water, and distribution. Um, since the start of industrial agriculture, yields per hectare have been shooting up, have been increasing, but so has world hunger. So this demonstrates there is not an issue of lack of food. The issue is who has the access. And if we look at our network, for instance, in Africa, and all the issue of land grabbing, land that is being grabbed for producing feed for animals, or producing feed for biofuels, or produce, sorry, for producing crops for biofuel, or producing crops for export, that has nothing to do with ensuring food security in those regions. The other thing I would like to say, that is another data that tells us that something is off. Nowadays, Europe wastes 20% of the food it produces, and most of it happens at primary production level, not at consum consumer level. This is EU data. I just this is EU data from uh, uh, last uh, beginning of September. It's very clear. I can show you. It's not true. The biggest waste is at consumer level, and then it's at distribution and transformation level, okay. and then you have at the producer level. I'll finish. So I took this data from a Eurobarometer October 2022, but happy to look into the more up-to-date data. Matter of fact, we are wasting 20% of the food intended for human consumption. So again, the issue is not the lack of food, the issue is the distribution. So no, we have been challenging together with other civil society organizations the idea that we need to produce more, because this is exactly what is making industrial food systems contribute to more than one third of the carbon dioxide emissions and to climate change. Mm. That is why I was saying we need and we believe strongly we need a different kind of change that it's, it is, of course, for many difficult to understand, okay, how do we, what are the steps we take? But that's why I was talking about all the tools we need, and I don't just mean the tools in terms of pesticide production, pro produ product, uh, pesticides, uh, product versus another pesticide product, it's about what are we teaching in schools when we talk about agriculture? And nowadays we're teaching industrial agriculture and essentially the conventional status quo. What are our advisory services saying on the ground? Where is the CAP money going? Because nowadays what we also should say is that, yes, it is, there is no free market in Europe because it is true that CFP subsidies are subsidizing a specific kind of agriculture. The last revision of the CP has not helped in going in the direction of a more environmental, a higher environmental ambition. And ultimately, yes, it turns out that the products that are produced with less negative externalities are the ones that are receiving the least support. And so, yes, they end up also being more expensive in the market. So I just want to quickly, because we're running yeah. out of time, uh, and I see we have some questions from the audience coming in. I wanted to quickly also turn to Sarah Wiener back uh, with the SUR coming up for a vote um, um, soon. And you're the rapporteur, so technically you represent the entire parliament. There has been so much pushback in the parliament from the different groups, the criticism uh, against your proposal. If, if the proposal that gets adopted in plenary isn't what you've proposed, but follows in the direction more of the groups like EPP, Renew Europe, uh, will you still support it and will you still fight or will you still uh, represent the parliament with that joint position in the trialogues should we get to them before the end of this mandate? So um, if we go uh, more in the direction of EPP, uh, so it will serve for nothing because they want to have goals under the SUD. So um, I think we have to look at it what comes out in the end. But of course, I I, as a rapporteur, uh, have to defend the majority in the parliament. So let's see, this is uh, just theory, what we are talking about. Let's see what's coming when we come then to, to the end of the negotiations. Then I can tell you clearly what I'm thinking of this. But it's not about my personal view or my personal beliefs. Uh, it's about to find really a, a substance uh, that gives also the farmers um, plant security, what's very important, and help them to free from uh, very expensive inputs. And I agree also uh, with the Deutsche Bauernverband that it's also a trading problem. We, we have uh, 
destroyed the structure of, of the possibility of the market to, to go uh, diverse. But we have to build it on because this is our uh, only chance to survive and have a robust future. So it's not about change one thing, one expensive uh, technofix uh, to another. It's about going more natural with natural laws and be clever and would need also of course, scientists, but it's not about that we say, uh, the zoo is not about just one point. Uh, it's just one small gap in the whole transformation of the, of the food system. It's not enough. We hear about food waste, we hear about um, healthy diets and so on. So there is, has a lot to change that we got robust for the future. And uh, sticking on that, this system, system is geared towards uh, further intensification and, um, and consummation. Uh, what I'm thinking, we have better solutions and robust solutions for the, for the farmers and also for the nature. So quickly looking at one of the questions that's come from the audience. What's, we have the glyphosate uh, that's up for renewal. Uh, the question is, what specific viable alternatives to glyphosate are the panelists most hopeful about? I wish I could ask everyone on the panel, but we're, we have less than a minute left. Rachel, what alternatives to glyphosate are, is Bayer working on? What seems to be closest to the market? Is there anything close on the horizon? Yeah, we, we, we're working on an alternative to the glyphosate, but we are working, of course, on, on weed control and how to control the, uh, the weeds. But just one thing on the solution, because we, have, we are talking a lot about Best of a protection, crop protection product, but there is a lot of other things, and there is not one solution which fits all. One field, one farm is one ecosystem, and I think that we need to be smart on choosing which kind of solution we can have. Sometimes it's, it's, a, it's possible to do uh, organic farming, but sometimes it's not, and we know that currently with the climate change, unfortunately, the farmers are, are really facing more problems, severe problems with pests. Uh, uh, and, and disease. So sometimes uh, one solution is going to work, another one, and what we want to propose is a system, and we should go for a system, I think, and not just one solution. We're out of time. I wish we could continue this discussion to, to, to dive more into the issues. Um, thank you to everyone on the panel. Thank you for, to the audience. Thank you for the online questions. Um, we will have a networking break, a short networking break taking place now, and later Eddie Wax will return to the stage to moderate the session on farmers of the future. So don't walk too far away, but do enjoy the short uh, networking break. Thank you. Thank you.